Hey friends, and welcome to the Happy Hour with Jamie Ivey podcast. I'm your host, Jamie, and I'm so glad you're here. Each week on this show, I invite a girlfriend to join me and we chat about the big things in life, the little things in life, and everything in between. Today's show is brought to you by Samaritan Ministries. Samaritan Ministries is a healthcare sharing ministry with over a quarter of a million Christians that care for one another's needs, from broken bones to cancer, pregnancies to organ transplants, all without the use of insurance. If you would like to learn more about how you can be a part of this ministry, helping each other with healthcare, visit SamaritanMinistries.org. Happy, happy Wednesday, you guys. I am so happy that you are joining me and my guests for some good girl time conversation today. I do want to say is that last week you guys shared so many incredible pictures and stories over on Instagram about the times that you have joined us at our happy hour live events. I love seeing pictures reminding me of how much fun each and every one of those events have been. I had so much fun looking back over all the events, all the guests that have been there, all the venues we've been in. It's been such a fun ride. It gets me excited for our weekend in May. We have another Happy Hour Live, our first one of 2020. It'll be on May 15th and 16th. That's a Friday and Saturday night right here in Austin, Texas. Now, we moved to a bigger venue this time, which is awesome because we get so many DMs and emails and messages from you guys telling us that you missed getting your tickets last time. Well, now is your time. We've still got space for you to join us and we cannot wait. Check out jamieivy.com slash events for all of the details. The evening is going to be so much fun. My guests on Friday night are Tasha Morrison and Shelly Giglio. My guests on Saturday night are Christy Wright and Jennifer Allwood. It's like a live podcast taping, but I don't release them, you guys, because you have to be there to hear it, which makes the event even more fun. We have goodie bags with great gifts for you. I mean, the goodie bag alone is worth like so much of your ticket. We have a dinner, we have drinks, we have a DJ, we have shopping. It is really, really a great girls' night. I would love for you to join us. First of all, I'd love for you to come visit my favorite city in the world, Austin, Texas. Other than that, I'd love to meet you and give you a hug. Check out jamieivy.com slash events for all information about tickets. If you're listening to this on release day, and you might be heading to Fort Worth this weekend for the Therefore Teen Gathering, please come say hi to me. I love meeting listeners so much. And I love this event, this Therefore Teen Gathering, because I am so for this next generation of girls coming up and we get to talk about Jesus together. It's gonna be a fun weekend. If you're there, come say hi. Now on to the happy hour today. My friend Courtney Rysick joined me. Courtney's a writer and a Bible teacher. She lives in Little Rock, Arkansas with her family and her four boys. She's also authored three books, one of them which just released earlier this year. Courtney and I talk about our emotions today. Courtney shares her faith story and the birth story of her fourth son with me. Courtney's story is a rich example of obedience and a beautiful example of how God's word is a core source for our deepest longing. Okay, you guys, here is the conversation with my friend, Courtney. Hey, Courtney, welcome to the happy hour. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming to Austin, Texas. Oh, you're welcome. Did you know I used to live near here? Where? In San Marcos. Did you really? Mm -hmm. I grew up in Dallas. Did you go to school at San Marcos? Mm Mm-hmm. First semester. Uh, Was it Texas State? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't Texas State when I was in college. It wasn't Texas State when I was there either. Oh, really? Mm Mm-hmm. Now I can't remember. It was Southwest Texas Southwest Texas. So it changed like right after. Okay. So. Where'd you go after that? I got saved. Okay. And then I went to, I moved, my parents had moved to Michigan. So I moved up there and lived at home for a semester. And then I moved to Minnesota and finished at a small Christian college in Minneapolis. Okay, I'm gonna need to fill in some blanks here. There's lots of You were from Fort Worth. Dallas. Dallas. Garland. Garland. Garland, yeah. Your parents lived there. Yeah. You came to Southwest Texas. Yeah. Texas State, go mm-hmm. Bobcats. Yeah. <laughs> not a Christian. Not a Christian. Did not grow up in a Christian home. I did. Okay, tell I, me what yeah, happened. I was a pastor. Oh, tell me everything. So my, I grew up, my parents had, so I grew up in a Christian home. We, I was born in California and then we moved to where my dad's from, Detroit, Michigan, when I was three. Then my dad went to seminary DTS. So that's why we moved to Dallas when I was eight. And then we lived there my whole upbringing. So like up until, until I was 21. And my parents had this middle period of time where they kind of had like wilderness wandering. We weren't in church as an entire family. Even your dad, the pastor. He wasn't a pastor. So he finished at DTS and... Um, he didn't finish a DTS actually. And the Lord just took our family through some things where they had to work through some things. And so he, he would say he was running from the ministry. And so then when I was in high school, the Lord kind of brought my parents 
back to faithfulness and obedience. And so then they, um, he started pursuing ministry again. So he served like in Sunday school ministry, things like that. The church started going to again, but I was kind of disinterested. So I, I kind of followed their trajectory of like, oh, our whole family's having this obedience to the Lord thing, but I don't think it really stuck. And so when I started college, I started a community college in Dallas. Um, I just really loved the world. And uh, they kind of gave me like an ultimatum of you're going to love the world or you're going to follow the rules of this family. And they were moving to Michigan so my dad could pastor a church. So I stayed in Texas. And so for a year and a half, I lived my own life and did what I wanted to do. And Okay. Can you imagine? I'm thinking like as a parent. Oh, yeah. Parent now it's now. different. Yeah. Yeah. The, how terrifying. hard that must have been for your parents, oh, for though, sure. is what yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah. Because, you know, we have those thoughts of what will we do when our kids do this? Yes. I think now, because like the twins are six and they're they're eight, they're almost seven. And so they're starting to have some spiritual questions. And I'm realizing now how much I can't save my kids. And that's one of the more terrifying things. And then to think in my parents' life, like that I was an, a, an adult and living on my own and they had zero control except for they could just pray that God would grip me. And uh, that's all I have with my kids. I mean, often I'm just like, I just want you to believe and I can't make them. And that's the- Isn't that crazy? Yes, it's the hardest part. Um, I, I've thought about that often as um, the flip side of you can't save your kids. You mm-hmm. also can't send them, can't damn them to hell either. Like, you know- Right, right, so, absolutely. So yes. I always think like, okay, we're, it's our job to point yeah. them to the Lord, to teach them what is right. true. And then at the end of the day, we just stand there open-handed. right. And it's the hardest thing in the world. It is. It's so hard. I I thought because I have a two year old as well, so it's a little bit black and more black and white with a two year old. Like you obey. I mean, you just have to obey. Like yeah, your is. only job in life is to just do what I tell you to do. And, and they fail most times. Most of the time, yeah. Our two year old's favorite word is no. Yeah. So, um, and I feel like that seemed so hard when that's all I was doing, but now it's like oh, I'll take that yes, <laughs> any day, any day. You know, like. Um, and so, then when they get older and you're having harder conversations. Yes. So your parents gave you this ultimatum. Hey, yeah. you like follow our rules yep. or you do your own thing, yep. but you can't do both. Right. And I really don't like following rules. Still so. to this day? Yeah. I kind of like, it's good. A little yeah. rebel in you. Yeah. Yeah. My husband is a very um, rule follower. I don't think he's broken a whole lot of rules in his entire life. And so I'm just kind of like, they're kind of suggestions. <laughs> I love you that. Know? So ask for forgiveness later. Like, yeah. let's see how far we can take this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So you did community college and then you ended up in San Marcos. I did. And tell me about how you met Jesus. I, so I was right. Ra- one of the things that's been helpful to me as a parent now is that my parents were really, really committed to teaching us the word and put, having us in church when we were really little. So I have vivid memories of going to church when I was young and doing like Awanas and things like that. So it's helpful to me now that we have small children and seeing, oh, I remember this. Like These I, things matter. Yes. And I remember us being weird in like public school because my parents had rules and other friends' parents didn't. And so that our kids are in public school. And so that's just helpful to me to have that memory. So there was always that foundation that, and I think even when I was rebellious, there was something in my there was this foundation there that I was like, I mean, I met Christians and I was like, I know all that. I've learned that before. And, but I, I really liked the world. I liked being liked. I liked friends. And so I, I, but one day I had been living, life had gotten harder, increasingly harder for me. Uh, I wasn't making a lot of money working. School had been hard. I was to pay my bills and things like that. And so I, and I broke up with a guy I had been with the whole time that I'd kind of been away from my family. And I literally woke up one morning after like a hard night of partying and I felt guilty for the first time. Like I- You had not experienced guilt No, before. I had kind of felt, and maybe I had and just kind of had suppressed it, I don't know. But I, it was an unshakable guilt. Like I, I think I just kind of hit rock bottom where I was like, I don't really like feeling like this. This is, and so- I can only attribute it to the Lord. I mean, how else, why else would I wake up feeling guilty doing the what you'd always been what doing? What I'd always been doing, yeah. So I called my mom and I had at that point decided to move home, even though I wasn't repentant. And my parents were like, were fine with that. I had gotten mono, I was really sick, and I just kind of needed some help. And they had hoped that that was the Lord drawing me, and they were content to let me come home in the hopes that the Lord was changing my, my heart, even though I wasn't fully repentant. So, I don't, I have no idea when I truly was like, I'm saved. Cause I, it was just like, I feel guilty. 
But then I'd like fall back in old habits and things like that. And I think just living at home for six months, trying to get healthy again and being around my family and going to church, just things like that just grew me. And and by the time that six months was up, I was pretty certain I was saved. So I went to a Christian school because I felt like I really kind of needed a safe little environment, like an, like a safety net. Because yeah. I knew if I went back to like a big state school, I was such a follower, I would just do whatever everybody else and did. And the same temptations. Yeah. Everything would be there. Yeah. So I wanted a safety net and I hadn't really been around Christians. And so I went, I went to this Christian college, like so excited. And I was around all these kids who'd been kind of sheltered their entire lives and lived with um, all these rules. And I was like, I don't, at that time, I didn't care if I had rules. Cause I was like, I just really want to be obedient. Yeah. yeah. So I was at a, um, I was in Minneapolis. And so I knew there was, I didn't know anything about who John Piper was. My parents were like, there's this pastor named John Piper. And I was like, okay. And I was like, they're like, it's a, it's a church where you'll hear the Bible preached, so you should just check it out. And so I went there. I didn't know who he was at all. And so that was my first experience in church was at Bethlehem. That is hilarious. So, and I didn't know what sovereign meant. Like people yeah. would use sovereign in sentences. And I was like, what is this? Yeah, I'm like, oh God, the sovereign, sure. Yeah. So when you went to that um, private school college, mm-hmm. Did you ever feel as though people were kind of judging you or thinking less than you? Or how did you handle that? Because no, you mentioned that they were, you know, real followers and Christians. And then yeah. here you are, this newfound love yeah. for the Lord. There wasn't, there was, there was two types of kids there. There was like the edgy kids who wanted to kind of rebel against the rules that they had had. Um, and I, those kids just made me sad because I was like, well, you don't understand what the baggage that comes with living like this. Like you, you, you don't have any of that baggage. Like, why would you want to? to live yeah. like that. And then I also, I often felt like I didn't fit sometimes with, because all the girls that I had become friends with kind of lived like these really moral lives and praise the Lord for that. Yeah. I mean, there's no, I, I don't think I ever felt judged by them. I probably felt a lot of my own insecurity yeah. of, I don't really fit. Mm-hmm. So, and, I, and I've always been kind of like a, like I wanted to be a writer early on, even before I got saved. And so I wanted to be a writer. And then once I got saved, I just really liked studying the Bible and reading. And so I kind of felt a little different in that regard because I just want to study theology yeah. and I just wanted to read the Bible. And, you know, I love hearing your story about that, you know, conversion. Because yeah. I think a lot of times people can get hung up on when did I start following Jesus? Or even yes. when you're walking alongside a friend and it's right. not that you have that moment where they right. look at you and say, I want to follow Jesus. And that does happen. And that is sure. necessary to acknowledge sure. that. But you see this transformation over their life and yes. you start to go, we see that you're different. We right. see that you're different. Right. And that's encouraging because some people feel, if I didn't have this like fireworks and yeah. fall on my face, right. then I don't know who I am. Right. But you're saying, and I kind of have a similar story, but yeah. there's this kind of, there's this journey. Yeah. And I don't think, I think sometimes I struggled with that. I didn't have, like when you felt like you go on a missions trip and they ask When's you- When's the date? Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, it was sometime around Christmas <laughs> yeah, no. that I felt guilty. Yeah. And then sometime in January, I started wanting to read the Bible. So I don't know, yeah. you know, like I don't have, but I think that's the testimony of scripture when you look at the, um, like how like in, in John 15 with abiding, like if you abide in the vine, you're going to bear fruit. And um, even in the parable of the sower, like the, it's the length of your life. I mean, a lot of people can have a moment with Jesus, but are they going to stay over the long haul? And I mean, left to myself, I wouldn't stay. You I know, know, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm very prone to wandering and uh, giving up. I'm a natural born quitter. So what's your Enneagram number? Oh, it's a four. Why did you say it like that? Because I feel like it's all emotional, which I, and I was telling you my- You just wrote about all your, all I the did. emotions. I did. One of my friends yeah. was like, I, one of my friends was, um, she's the one who got me into reading about it. She was like, I told her about the book when I got the contract. She's like, of course you're a four. And I was like, okay, stop. Just stop. Writing about all your emotions. Yeah. We need it though. You know, some of us right. need it who don't want to think about our emotions. So what are you? I'm a six. So what's a six? You know, it's based on what your motivation is. Okay. You know, like you're motivated yeah. for uniqueness. What's a four? Like what's your core motivator? I think it's uniqueness. But I took it, I, that one of them was, what was the one that your motivator is like fear and anxiety? That's me. So I took, I'm so a six. I, I took it again just recently uh-huh. and I was like, I tied for a four and a six. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. I'm a six wing seven. Okay. I, I wanted to be a three so badly. They're achievers. They get things done. I know, they make yeah. things happen. Yep. 
But they also don't know their, they're not really in touch with their feelings often. No, they're not. I, I'm very in touch with my feelings. Yeah. <laughs> my husband's a three wing four. So okay. I get a little bit of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was reading it to my husband. I was like, I don't want to be a four. And he was like, read it to me. And so I read it to him and he's like, that's you. <laughs> that's who you are. And but the thing too about the Enneagram that a lot of people get hung up on is that it does show you maybe some of your negative defaults. Right. But it also shows you how you're right. such an asset to the world and how right. you need all different right. personalities yeah. to make this planet go round and round. Right. And my friend who is a one was telling me, she was like, fours are so great because they make the best listeners. Oh, see, do you feel that about yourself? Oh, well, people tell me a lot of things. Yeah. So <laughs> I, and I like to, I like to hear people's stories, but then I also take on like everybody's, like every time like someone tells me something, I'm like, oh, let's bear that burden together. You're in it with them. I am. And it's so, a good friend. Oh, I hope so. That's a so, really good friend. Yeah. So, but I do feel deeply. Yeah. I probably always have. Yeah. Okay. So I, I love hearing your story, but you get saved. You go, you start going to John Piper's church. Yeah. And then... I know that you went to seminary. I Tell did. me how you ended up there. So I graduated from college and I was working for a ministry. And I mean, at the time I had this view, like the only thing you can do for the Lord is ministry, like full-time vocational ministry. And I, I mean, obviously I think I'm called to full-time vocational ministry, but um, the Lord has kind of shaped that more to seeing how everything matters as I've grown older. But um, I was single and I, I was about six months after I had met some people from Southern Seminary and they were like, you should apply to go to seminary. And I was like, women don't go to seminary. I mean, women did not go to seminary when, I mean, this is like 12 years ago. There were not as many girls at seminary as there are now. And I, I was like, I'm a complimentarian. Like, I mean, I remember thinking, and then, but then whenever they were like, we have, we can go to seminary. You don't have to, and you can take all the same classes. That blow your mind. Yes. And and it just was like right up my alley. I'm like, this is what I love, this kind of stuff. Like I tried to be a major in Bible and my dad was like, you need to pick a marketable degree. I'm <laughs> <Come> sorry. <on. laughs> like you can't just major in Bible. Yeah. And um, so I picked English, but then, uh, which is not marketable either. <laughs> yeah. But um, so then I had been asked to be on the women's leadership team at Bethlehem because that's what I wanted to do. And I thought, well, I'm only like 24, so... I could go to seminary now. Why not? You know, I'm single. Yeah. I've got nothing else Great stopping time. me. Yeah. So I went and I was determined not to be a girl who got married at seminary. And you were. Yes. Oh. So, but I love my husband. He's great. So y'all met in seminary. Yes. Okay. But did. you didn't finish then. No, I didn't. And you just started back. I did. Southern still? Yep. How so, is it going? It's going well. It's it's really, I've been really struck. I t I've taken one class and I'm in my second one now. And I've just been so struck by how helpful it is just so incredibly helpful yeah, yeah like i i took systematic three which is the only systematic theology class that i haven't taken and I, maybe it's because i'm older and i've done ministry and 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 just have different outlets for talking thinking about these things but i feel like i learned more in that class than i ever learned wow. before and i bet you in 10 15 years if i stopped and went back again i'd probably learn more i mean every time every yeah. season how many years she graduate Oh, forever. Um, so I'm going very slowly. Yeah. So I'll probably finish in um, three years. Okay, that's great. Yeah. My goal is to finish before I'm 40 and I'm almost 37. Great. So, but I really, I want to do a doctor of education too. So after that, you'll go yeah. on to get that. Yeah. And we'll call you Dr. Courtney. Yeah. I told my husband, I said, when we get wedding invitations, it'll say Mr. and Dr. Rysick. Oh, that would be so <laughs> awesome. Okay, so you said that you had this feeling at the beginning of women don't go to seminary. Right. And I would I don't think that with the majority of my listeners, that would be a common thought that they would have. Right. But there are some people who still think that. Yes. What trans what besides them telling you, no, well, you can take all the classes, you can do all right. these things. Have you ever felt anything else in seminary that's saying because you're a woman, you can't do this? At school, that's what I mean. Yeah, so I thought seminary was only for training pastors. pastors and so right. since I didn't feel convictionally that I should be a pastor, then I thought, well, What's I, can, the point? I can read all these things on my own. I don't have to. Because I grew up in a home where I'm one of four, but I have all brothers. And I have one brother who is a pastor. And it was never like, you're a girl, they're a boy, they do these things. And you, we were all equal. And oh, so good. I learned how to kind of like, so going to seminary for me was not weird. I mean, it was 80, 20 percentage. So like 20% women, 80% men when I got there. I was often the only female in my class and it did not feel strange to me at all because I'd grown up in a home where I have something to say, I say it. Yeah. And my mom has something to say and she says it. And so I attribute my 
interest and feeling confident to go into those settings where it was more male dominated with the fact that my dad greatly values me and my brothers greatly value me. That's really good to hear as parents. Yes. If you can do nothing else for your daughters, treat them as equals. I mean, that's huge. Yes. And in everything. Now, here's my question. Did you have to take the trash out? Yeah. I take the trash out now. Because I agree. This is where I, I am so pro women. We can do anything. <laughs> you but don't I do not make out. my daughter take the trash out. I don't mow the grass. See, I love mowing the grass. So is I that funny? Yeah. So my husband's a perfectionist. And so he doesn't want me mowing the grass. Oh, he's a one, huh? Oh, he is a one. But you he's know, isn't it funny that at my house, my dad always took the trash out. And so then oh, me, yeah. I had this weird thing. Like, I am not taking the trash out. Right. I'm like, I'm a woman. I can do anything I need, but can you please take the trash out for me? <laughs> yes. I don't know. I so like I don't taking, make sure we take the trash out. I like taking the trash out because I like efficiency. Okay. And if it's overflowing, I just want to get it out. Even if it's her chore, because my kids have a different chore each week yes. and trash is one of them. Yes. Um, what does she do with it? Well, sometimes she does, obviously. But then other times I'll be like, hey, Story's going to take it to the mudroom. Can one of you boys take it out for her? <laughs> what am I doing to my kids? So like when I lived alone, like I, I wouldn't take the trash out when it was dark she, like, yeah, she in, an, want in an apartment. Like yeah. when I was in an apartment, I wouldn't take the trash out when it was dark, things like that. Safety first, but we're yeah. not dealing with safety here. We're dealing with, yeah. I'm creating, I don't know what I'm creating, but anyhow, I'll tell her she can do anything else she wants, but well, she doesn't have to take the trash out. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there's anything else in my husband. My husband does a lot of things. He's really, he's very invested in us both doing the stuff at home. So we share responsibilities. Yeah. So but. um, besides, and, and I, I say this with the utmost respect and you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. You're an author. Yes. Um, do you work outside the home in any other way? Um, And you know what I mean? Like no, that is I, a job. No, I totally, no, I totally understand. No, I, um, so I don't have a job that I go mm-hmm. to now. Okay. Yeah. So. so you stay home with your boys. I do. And write books and minister in your church. I do. And I sometimes travel to speak. Yeah. Yeah. I say some, I used to say I occasionally travel and, Lately and in the spring, it's like once a month. So I'm like, I should just say that I travel. You to do speak. travel to speak. Yeah, once a month is traveling to speak. Yeah, yeah. So do you like doing that? I do. I do. It's um, I love I love teaching the Bible. I I just really really love teaching the Bible, and I really love seeing women love the Bible. And so when I get to do that, I, I it's really exciting. It's increasingly harder the older my kids have gotten, and so when they're more aware that I'm leaving, mm-hmm. some of them have harder times with that. And so having to reconcile. It's okay to share mommy with other people so people can learn about Jesus. Like that's that's a hard thing, but I love it. And my husband loves sending me off to do it. So. I love it. Have you seen in the years that you've been doing this, um, I know you released your first book in 2015. Mm-hmm. So um, have you seen an increase in women desiring to be in the word more? Like in your experience with women and your love for God's word and your love for seeing women dive in, what are you seeing? Are you seeing an increase in women going, hey, this is important? Or are you seeing a little stagnant? What do you think? Just oh, I think an increase. Good. So I I wonder if it's an increase, maybe not an increase, but we're just more aware of the okay. desires always been there and the resources are now available. So I think women... Because for a long time, I thought I was the only woman who kind of wanted, who cared about this kind of stuff. But as I, as the internet has allowed women to connect with each other and these other organizations have come up and then we're, we're seeing just women. And I think Jen Wilkins stuff has just, I think Jen has done. She's done a great job. Yeah. And she's done a lot uh-huh. to kind of raise awareness yeah. that this kind of is already there. So even, even in um, my previous church context that we were in, I saw women just growing in their love for the word. But in the church I'm in now that doesn't have a lot of formal Bible studies, they there is a deep desire for women to want to just know the word. And so I think maybe it's always been there. Women have been finding ways to meet and talk about the Bible for a long time. time, I just think we're more aware of it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you have um, The Accidental Feminist in April of 2015. Yeah, May. May. Oh, May. Okay, Glory in the Ordinary, 2017. Yes. And then Teach Me to Feel, which came out... January 2020. Yep. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, Teach Me to Feel um, is about emotions from our from our Enneagram 4, Courtney over here. <laughs> um, but what I think is interesting about this book that I really like the way you set it up is the chapters are when you feel fill in the blank. Right. And then you take us to God's word through a psalm. Right. So for example, when you feel let down, despair, forsaken, in pain, worthless, anxious, fearing death, Content, grateful. All, I mean, there's 20 different options here. What led you to write about emotions? I wanted to write about the Psalms first because the Psalms were really meaningful to me. And as I worked with my publisher on what would be a good avenue for that, we just kind of, publishers are so great in helping you kind of shape your message. Yeah, yeah. and uh-huh. like what you want to say. And so they were like, you're really actually speaking about 
emotions and how the Psalms are giving you language to feel. And I was like, yes, that's what I'm saying. (laughs) So (laughs) what I'm saying. So started all of that is I, about a year before this happened, I had, had led a Bible study on wisdom literature and, and, and the Psalms. And through that grew to love the Psalms because I understood kind of how they fit together and things like that. And so I spent some time kind of just understanding them and studying them. And then I was, um, 32 weeks pregnant with my fourth son and had a severe pregnancy complication. I had a placenta abruption and it was a partial abruption. So what is that actually? So it's where the placenta pulls apart from the uterus prematurely. And so it's, um, if it's a full abruption, it's, you have five minutes to save the baby and 10 minutes to save the mother. Okay. Let me ask a question. Yes. Do you know that's happening? So that five minutes, like I'm doing dishes and I have five minutes? Not always. Or so sometimes, so, so I've heard of women where they feel a sharp pain and then it's done. Like- um, so in my case was a partial, so it, he still had like life, like he still had, it was, a, I, we found out after he was delivered that it was a 75, it was a 25% eruption. How did you know it was happening? The pain? Severe pain. Yeah. So like I had been in labor before, thankfully. So I had, I knew that I was like, this feels like a contraction that never stops. Okay. And you're 32 weeks. 33. 33 weeks. Okay. Yeah. So um, I went into the hospital in the middle of the night and they thought my uterus was rupturing. I'd had C-sections before. So they thought maybe that was what was happening. And everything was fine early on. And then within a matter of hours, they went from thinking it was maybe gallbladder to which would have been preferable because they get to take that out Mm -hmm. uh, to his heart rate started dropping. I started having contractions and... I, it was kind of fuzzy because I was in so much pain that I don't really remember. And they were like, we might deliver him. We got to get steroids in you. And we just didn't know. And so for the first 48 hours, everything was really uncertain. As Is he going to be delivered? Is he going to live? Am I going to live? Is, are things going to be okay? We lived in the hospital for three weeks in that state. For the first 48 hours before he was delivered? He wasn't delivered for three weeks after that. So you were able, they were able to keep him in? Yes. With a partial... Yeah, they didn't know how partial it was. So the monitor tells you a lot about how the baby's doing. And so the monitor, if his heart rate monitored fine, then the placenta was giving him enough. So they were saying, if it drops, we're going in. Yes. Okay. So, and they would have, I'd have these moments where it would drop a little bit and they're like, let's hold on and see. And the gamble was always, there's going to be a time where it drops and it doesn't come back up. So when is that? And nobody knows. So um, there were some days where I'd be on continuous monitoring and then he would kind of stabilize and I would stabilize and I wouldn't have pain. And so we would just kind of wait. But we couldn't take care of our other kids because even though we lived like 10 minutes from the hospital, they didn't want Daniel to leave. Oh my gosh. Because at any minute, they could rush you into the hospital. Yeah. And there's no guarantee that a a live baby is going to be delivered or that I'd be okay or... Um, and I had like a like a long term IV in because like if I was gonna be in the hospital a long time, I needed to have an IV in at all times, so they could put me under at any point. So Courtney, it was crazy. <laughs> Today's show is brought to you by Third Love. Designed with measurements from millions of women, I'm serious about that, millions of women, Third Love's bra styles are made to fit your life. They have over 80 bra sizes, but really the only one that matters is yours. I've been wearing Third Love for a while now, and sometimes I find myself actually, it's the only bras I ever wear. I have four of them. They're so comfy. Their customer service is amazing. They want you to get the perfect bra for yourself. My favorite bra is the lace black t-shirt bra. I recently got the cotton wireless bra and you guys, I had to send it back for a different size, which I'm about to tell you, it's not that big of a deal. Their customer service is amazing. You have 60 days to wear it, wash it, put it to the test. If you don't love it, return it or exchange it. If you return it, they're gonna wash it and donate it to a woman in need. Isn't that amazing? And they're gonna get help you get the right size because that's their number one goal. It is hands down the most comfortable bra you are going to own. It has straps that won't slip, a tagless label, and lightweight memory foam cups which mold to your shape. Like I already told you, returns and exchanges are free, and I'm here to tell you, easy as well. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now, they're offering all of my Happy Hour listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash Jamie, that's my first name, J-A-M-I-E, right now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash Jamie for 15% off today. Today's show is brought to you by Ritual. We all want to do the right thing to keep our bodies healthy in the long run. 
But even if we try really hard to eat all the kale salads and drink all the green smoothies, we're still most likely not getting all of the essential nutrients that we need on a daily basis. So that is where Ritual, the obsessively researched vitamin for women, comes into play. Ritual's essentials have the nutrients most of us don't get enough of from our food, all in their clean, absorbable forms with no harmful additives or ingredients. Two easy-to-take capsules provide nine nutrients you need to support a strong foundation for your health. From D3 to Omega-3, Ritual's Essential for Women helps fill gaps in a woman's diet. Their no-nausea capsule design is even gentle on an empty stomach. And for all of you obsessive label readers, Ritual's vegan-friendly, sugar-free, non-GMO, gluten-free, and allergen-free ingredients and their sources are out there for the whole world to see. A subscription is easy to start and it's easy to snooze as well. It's only a dollar a day to have all the essential nutrients your body needs delivered every single month. I personally have been taking Ritual for a few months and I love that I don't have to think about, am I actually getting all things I need for my body? Even on days that I have a kale salad and a green smoothie, Ritual has taken the stress away. And by taking my capsules each day, I am supporting my body to make sure I'm getting those essential nutrients. Friends, better health does not happen overnight. And right now, Ritual is offering all of my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash happy hour to start your ritual today. That's 10% off during your first three months at ritual.com slash happy hour. So you're living in the hospital for three weeks. Yes. Not knowing what this outcome is going to be. Right. Who's taking care of your kids? Well, at first our church did. So they were amazing. They arranged around the clock care for them. Because pa- we don't live near family. And so my mom, it was, I think of my mom and how she was f- so nervous about me and then nervous about her grandson as well. I mean, the anxiety that she must have been feeling like there's two people who I could lose in this moment. And so it was, as a mother, I think, oh my goodness, how yeah. could she? So she couldn't get there for a few days. So she got there after three or four days, but the church cared for them. I know. You're going to make me cry. Well, I, I've, been prepa- I've been emotionally prepared. Because I know, talking about this book, is going to be, I have to talk about this over and over again. And I'm like, if I start crying, then I'm like a blubbery mess. <laughs> so my mom got there. And then within about 20, the twins were four and Seth was two. So That is so much work. Yeah, two so, four-year-olds and a two-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> so about, four, about 24 hours in, my dad was like, she can't do this indefinitely. <laughs> yeah, no, of course so not. So he drove like the van, his van to Arkansas. To from get, Michigan? No, from Florida. They lived in Florida. Oh, okay, in Florida. And they, um, pick, he picked everybody up. And they took them to their house. Yes, because my two of my brothers lived in, live in Florida. Um, and so one of my sisters-in-law could help share the load. They could just share the load. And they could, and the kids, and what was really hard on the boys initially was they had three different sets of caregivers a day. So the church had set up round the clock care, but they couldn't do like full shifts. For and sure. so they'd have like morning shifts, afternoon shifts and then overnight shifts. And occasionally if things were stable, Daniel could go home and give them some stability. But our our two-year-old, he's now four, he is just our more tender-hearted, nervous, anxious, was so attached to me. And he wouldn't get out of bed. Like people oh, would go get him in the morning me. and he would be like, no, no. Like, cause he was just scared. Like he didn't understand. And and the twins were, I mean, they had moments. It was hard to kind of know like how they were doing, but um, for the longest time they called the hospital mommy's hospital even yeah. for like months after. But so my, once my mom got there, she was the stabilizing influence. And my dad felt like if he could take them to Florida, then they could have some stabilizing influence with like a bunch of family. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so you're in the hospital three weeks. Every day is like, we don't know what's happening. And yes. it, it, is the goal here, how can we keep this baby in as long as possible? Yes, obviously. the goal was so to get him to 34 lungs, weeks. All the things. Yeah, okay. 34 weeks and then get him to 36 weeks. And I had had premature babies before. So the twins are born at 32 weeks. Yeah. So I knew what was at stake. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had we had done that before. And so we were, if we got, I knew if we got him to 36 weeks, he could be fine. Uh, and, and maybe could even be in the room with me and go home and things like that. And so, but every day was, is it gonna, is it today gonna be the day? And so honestly, the only thing, what led to the book was the only thing I could read was the Psalms. I I mean, I used to think that if you were on hospital bed rest, it would be like a, like fun. Like you could play games. Like watch you could TV. Watch TV. We don't have cable. Doesn't that sound awesome to have all that cable on the TV? Yes. And all? Yeah, no. People bring you food, <laughs> like, and it was anything but that. And people were well-meaning and they'd bring me all kinds of things to read. And I, I couldn't focus. Like mm. I couldn't get, and everything just felt like trivial. I, even my, my second book came out the three weeks before this happened. Oh gosh. 
So it, he was due in July and the book came out in April. And I thought, I'll get to do all this book stuff and I can even do podcast interviews from home. And I had to cancel everything. Like mm-hmm. I, it was, it was, I feel like the Lord freed me from caring about that kind of yeah. stuff because in that moment I was like, nothing matters except for us getting to the other side yeah. of this with a baby. How are you, the thought of like being in the hospital room, knowing that your baby could not survive is a just one that I can't even understand. Like that yeah. is so difficult. And then we've had people on the show who've actually had diagnosis and known that they were going to lose their baby when the right. baby was born. And it's just tragic. Right. How do you handle also knowing that you could die? And so you're looking, your boys, you, did you get to even see your boys after you went to the hospital? Yeah, so we would bring, the people would bring them up to see okay, me. Okay, so there's that. But your husband's there all the time. But it, I don't understand the feeling of every day knowing I could die through this. Right. Which, granted, I've never walked through any yeah. illness or terminal or anything. So I know that some people they're going, well, Jamie, welcome to my life. Yeah. Um, but talk to us who have not experienced yeah. that. Yeah. What, is, what are those emotions that you're having to deal with and wrestle with and kind of even say, God, if this happens, well, I mean, I don't know what you were saying. I'm okay. I'm not. What were you thinking? Yeah. I mean, we had dealt with a fair amount of suffering with pregnancy, infertility, and miscarriage prior to that. And I really thought I had worked through all that. And the Lord really showed me I had another lesson to learn. I had more I had to work through. And I, I just would pray like desperate prayers. Like I... I know that I'm going, I know, I believe in the resurrection, right? I believe in that. But I I also believe that my kids need a mom. And when my dad, I still remember, I mean, Dana and I will say that it's like the worst day we ever experienced when my dad brought them up there to say goodbye. And they walked out and I remember thinking, what if they come home to no baby brother? And like, what if they come home to no mom? And like how, like Seth would never remember me. Like he would never know. And like the twins would have very little memories of me. And how will they ever know any, like will will they hate God? Will they doubt that he's good? Will they doubt anything about everything we say we believe? How do you prepare them for a lifetime of that kind of suffering and loss? Um, And then, I mean, even Daniel, I mean, he had to really deal with, like I I could lose them both. And um. And so I think I did, I did not process any of those emotions in the hospital. So I kind of lived in this heightened state of like adrenaline of, and I, and I think some of it was just maybe safety for the baby. And I don't know, but oh, probably he, that makes sense. Yeah. Like I don't, I just was, I, I remember feeling emotional, but I mostly just felt like I, all I could do is just like read the Psalms and pray. I believe I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I really want the land of the living not to be the resurrection. I want it to be right now, <laughs> you know? And people think the labor and delivery unit is such a happy place um, where all the, you, you go and you have a baby. And I was on the high risk unit where every woman on that floor had a life or death situation where their baby could die. So I remember saying, I'd hear these other stories and I'm like, oh, that sounds terrible. And my nurse was like, yours is really bad. Like none of these women are, are, could die too. Like their babies could die, but. Yours, both of you. Yeah. So, but I got to walk the halls of, I, they, they let me walk the halls like the last week that I was there to kind of get like exercise or whatever. And I started realizing that I would see like white doves on doors with closed doors. And I remember asking, finally got the courage to ask someone, what does a white dove mean? And it was a woman laboring in there with a stillbirth. And so there was just a horrible weight of this is most people think of this as a really happy place. But for me, it carries so much sadness and angst. And I think I saw three or four of them when I would walk the halls and know, and every time I'd walk by, I think there's just so much agony in that room. Um, and so I think for me having to wrestle with, I didn't deal with those emotions in the hospital. I dealt with them a lot after, like I was just afraid to, Go outside. <laughs> I want to hear about your emotions, but I first, I want to follow that up because I want to know where was the hope in the hospital room for you? The And, and if there wasn't, like, no, I know it was, it was an incredibly hopeful time and which is, can only be attributed to the Lord. Cause I, how else do you have hope when you, when you could die and your baby could die and your children are in so much anxiety over what's going on and your husband is afraid. I, the only thing I can attribute it to is it's just a piece that passes understanding. I mean, in human understanding is there's no hope here. And we saw the Lord um, use that in the lives of the hospital staff. I mean, we've gone back and visited them a lot and they repeatedly will make comments about 
the church family that would come or the hopefulness that we had. And it's the Lord. And it was God gave us the strength to hope that He we could call Him good, even if the outcome was different. And that's a hard thing to say. I, I mean, I said it theoretically. Right. So I said, theoretically, I, I want to call Him good, even if the worst happens. And I want to believe in the goodness of the Lord and the land of the living, even if the land of the living is not the living right, right now. Yeah. And so that... The, I found a, and I found a lot of hope in the fact that I was not the first person who had walked through something like this. In the Psalms, I met familiar friends who had, who also were wrestling through their own suffering and their own difficulty and their own fears and anxieties. And I realized that it feels really isolating and like I'm the only person experiencing this right now, but I come from a long line of witnesses who can attest to God's goodness, even when it just feels like everything being thrown at me is not good. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, it was an incredibly hopeful time for us. I don't think we could look back in any way and say it wasn't hopeful. Yeah. We sensed the Lord's nearness through like people, through people coming, um, through caring staff. My doctor um, is an is a believer, so the whole OBGYN clinic, they're all believers. I love this. So this was like such a, and so every every doctor ended up coming to see me. I became like the the one they talked about in the office, like, what do we do if this happens again? Yeah. Do we deliver? Do we not deliver? Uh-huh. What are our orders? Or the case study. Yeah. So, um, because I don't have any of the risk factors of an abruption. So um, I was, my base, my, and I've had other issues in pregnancy. My body basically just hates pregnancy. Mm-hmm. It just revolts against it yeah. apparently. So yeah. they were, but they were so helpful in, having, they provided hope to us as well. So you, um, we know clearly that you and your baby both survived. We did. You're here. Yes. yes. at home. Yes. Um, Delivery, C-section. Yes. Um, How long were you guys in the hospital after? For a week after, because he was in the NICU for a week. Okay. Um, I know that you said you didn't process a lot in the hospital, which I I feel is so understandable when I'm hearing about what me not even understanding what those three weeks are like, but that would be difficult to process those emotions. Right. And I know you have told me previously that you walk through and struggle through, P- uh, not PTSD, postpartum depression. Yes, yes. I'm thinking that this is going to be worse because not only could you struggle with postpartum depression, mm-hmm. but you also could struggle with, now I have a three weeks worth of emotions right. that I have to deal with or else. Right. What did that look like as a new mom? Oh gosh, it's so hard. I mean, because it's not like you get to go home and process how you feel when you. I still remember my parents waited to bring the twins home and the boy, the three boys home until we'd been home for like twenty four hours. So we had like a day at home with Ben, and I was so excited for them to come. And I'm so glad I have a picture of the first time I saw them. Wow. And Daniel took it and I'm like weeping. Like I didn't think I would be. And I see them, I'm like holding Ben and like standing on our front porch, like weeping as they come out. And they're like running and being crazy. Yeah. And so that was like a really sweet moment. And then they come inside and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna die. Like it's so, la- I mean, I've been in a hospital that was kind of quiet for three weeks and I suddenly have like- and You didn't have to do anything really. I mean, you, it wasn't yeah, like I didn't a fun to, experience. You just no, said that. Yeah. But you don't have to do anything. No. You're not taking out the trash. No. You're not getting anyone a sippy cup. No one's no. asking for snacks. No. No one needs their diaper changed. Like it was just, and so they come, and, and you have to also think they're four and two, so no one's been disciplined for a long time. They've been at grandma grandpa's house too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so like it was, so it was just, I mean, it was, when they came in, both Dino and I were like, in just complete shock. This is our new reality. Uh, yeah. And for us, transitioning to four kids, I mean, it probably would have been hard to begin with. Some people say having four kids is like a piece of cake. If you have three, you have, but that, that was not our experience. Four was like, we're drowning, we're drowning, we're drowning. And we still sometimes feel like we're drowning. So we're like almost three years in. But um, it, so it was just, I didn't have a lot of opportunity to really think through it, but I would have these horrible emotional outbursts of being unable to cope, unable to function and, and just incredible fear of the, nothing feels safe. Nothing feels, nothing can be trusted. I didn't want to, I didn't want, like Ben slept in our room for like six months, which is for me, I get babies out quickly. Some people that's so normal, but it wasn't your norm. It was not our norm. Yeah. Like I, um, and there's just a lot of things where I just, I didn't want to put him in the nursery. I didn't put him in the nursery for six months. That wasn't our norm. Mm-hmm. And um, I was just afraid and everything, everything felt. And 
all of us are minutes away from death. That's the reality. We live in a fallen world where death is a hundred percent chance for everyone. I just had not lived that. I hadn't experienced the fragility of life. And I was young. I was 34. And so I hadn't, I just, I didn't, and I, and I honestly, I haven't, I haven't had a lot of friends die. I haven't had a lot of, I've had miscarriages, but I have not been to a lot of funerals. Yeah. So for me, it was just completely jarring. And I, I, st- I didn't want to live in a world where the world wasn't safe. Mm. And what's been helpful for me is that that reality is what most people live. And, and, and historically people have lived. Women routinely died in childbirth. Throughout the world, women routinely die in childbirth. They still do, yes. And that, like, that's like a whole nother conversation. But like, I, I, I was like, I, I just maybe just am, don't fit in American context, you know, like in Western modern yeah. context. But I have friends elsewhere who I could probably sit across the table from and we would have a kinship in, um, but in the same way, like many of us live in broken bodies and in, and have to wrestle with the effects of the fall. And that was just happened to be mine. So it's been three years. Yes, almost. Almost, almost three yeah. years. Um, from where you were then of this anxiety, fear, emotions, yeah. To the journey to today, mm-hmm. um, what is it? What do you feel now regarding like death? Just regarding you have I I can't handle my emotions, anxiety, fear, right. death. I cannot. Nothing safe. Do you still struggle with that today? Occasionally. Okay. Yeah, Daniel's been really helpful. He knows that there's certain things that'll just kind of trigger it for me. Where, and he just knows like there's if if I have to go to the hospital for things or. Um, our kids had a lot of health problems, like unexpected health problems in the, like in the last probably 36 months. And so one of them had to have surgery and then one of them was in the hospital. And so the Lord kept taking me back to those things. And I, I, it wasn't until I got through it where I realized he's healing me. Like he's healing me in that he's, I, I in each instance, I'm, I'm not as undone mm. as I was the first time. And I remember even last Christmas telling him, oh, like I'm not as, I don't feel as much in the darkness this Christmas because I remember the darkness and it's better. I think I probably will always struggle with some form of depression. I I mean, people have different, depression manifests itself at different times in people's lives. And so I do have kind of like ebbs and flows and uh, I have some hormonal imbalances I think that I know for certain contribute to that. And so I have some medication that helps with that. So I'm getting I'm better, but I also am not naive to think that something can't happen and I um, won't just kind of fall back into it. But the, I was in counseling for about six months and that really helped me step back and say, like, these things are going to happen and and focusing more on the Lord bringing me through it as opposed to, uh, focusing on like how I, I feel like I can't cope in the midst of it. So I'm getting better. I'm better than I was. I, see that, I think that is so beautiful. Even you said, I saw last Christmas, it wasn't as dark as the oh, year before. Oh, which is so helpful. And sometimes when we're in the middle of the darkest season, mm-hmm. we can't imagine any light coming in. No, we cannot. You can't no. imagine that no. there'd be any light ever again. No. You know, I mean, walking through hard things with friends at the very beginning, they say just what you said, like yeah. it's the darkest thing ever. Yes. And then a year later, they're like, I see a little bit of light. Yes. And there's that hope yes, that yes. is not going to leave us there. Right. Yeah. And then you see like all throughout scripture, God calling Christians to remember. And that's why mm. is because when we remember, we see, oh, he did bring me through. Like he did bring me through the the waters, the, the raging river that I thought was going to consume me. And and that gives us hope and and faith and the ability to press on knowing that he brought me through this he will bring me through the next thing. And I I, I, I I, read The Dangerous Journey, which is the Pilgrim's Progress kids version to my boys. And I quote this all the time because it's one of my favorite lines. And it's, it's the very end when Christian's about to walk across the river, the river of death all the way to the celestial city. And and as he's walking, the, the raging waters are coming up around his neck and he can't, he can't feel his footing. And he's, and he's like screaming for hopeful and he's like, I'm, he's terrified. And he's like, this is it. And there's no hope for me in the end. And just as he finds his footing, 
that so the waters are not going to destroy him. Uh, the book says, but the rivers, the waters that a man must go through are no sign that God has forgotten him. And every time I read it to the boys, I cry, which they freak out. They hate it. But uh, it's it's so true. It's the the waters are no sign that God has forgotten you. You're going to make it safely all the way through. And I have to remember that by looking back and seeing how he's done, done that for me in the past and he's going to do it for me in the future. And that's really hard in the moment because in the moment, I mean, you could ask my husband, I, I don't believe any of it. Mm-hmm. I'm like, it's not true. Yeah. But right today, right now, I'm in a good place. So I can say yeah. I've seen it. Yeah. And so it gives me, it spurs me on to press yeah. forward. Well, I'm glad that you wrote this book, Teach Me to Feel, because everything we just talked about, even though I've never walked what you just described, mm-hmm. I have felt that in some times in my life. Sure, sure. And so it is, these emotions are not uncommon. Sure, women. no, they're they are not. They're very common yes. to all of us and just put in our different scenario. And we have the same feelings Courtney right. felt. Right. Um, and so this book is gets such a good tool to point women back to the truth of God's word mm. in the midst of our emotions. Because emotions aren't bad. No, they're good. They're very real right. and good. They're not always a true revealer of what's happening. Right. Um, but that's why you point us to God's word, right. which is the true revealer right. of what it is. Right. So thank you for writing this. Well, I know that you. women's lives are going to be changed because of it. Well, I hope so. Today's What Are You Loving and What Are You Reading is brought to you by Oniko 2087. Book your next getaway to the stunning white beaches of Riviera Maya and immerse yourself in a -a one-of-a-kind experience. Oniko 2087 Hotel Riviera Maya is the aspirational, adults-only, all-inclusive hotel situated south of Playa del Carmen. Discover and embrace contemporary Mexico face-to-face and share in a passion for the region defined by relaxed luxury and cultural immersion. Dining at Oniko 2087 is a multi-sensory adventure. While locally sourced ingredients are a staple of every restaurant and bar, the offerings are a diverse mix of international flavors. There's exciting pop-up events, including cooking classes, mixology classes, salsa lessons, and so much more. Each of their three pools offers poolside food and drink services, as well as cabanas that can be booked in advance. They also offer personal training sessions, meditation and yoga, beachfront classes, and state-of-the-art gym. Visit onicohotelrivieramaya.com or contact your preferred travel professional. I am loving, um, so I recently wasn't able to drink coffee for a while because I thought I had, I thought I was growing an aversion to coffee, but I figured out. What do you mean growing an aversion to coffee? Well, I was having some, I was just recently diagnosed as pre-diabetic. I know we didn't even talk about which it. Which is another thing, um, thanks to pregnancy. Um, but I was having all this nausea and it was worse in the morning. And I thought it was because of coffee. I was just cutting out things, trying to figure yeah, it out. Yeah. And once I realized, once I cut out like sugar completely, I realized, oh, I, coffee ta- sounds good to me again. So, but I can drink this like Trader Joe's almond peppermint creamer. And it's got a little bit of sugar in it, but I put a splash in and it's amazing. And it makes me so happy. And so I drink that in the morning with my coffee right now. And I'm just happy that I like coffee again. Did you cut out all sugar? Yeah, like I can't have it. Because what? Because of the pre-diabetic stuff? Yeah, so they're trying to keep me from getting type 2 diabetes, which I probably will. That's um, the trajectory for what you have? Mm-hmm. So there's, and because I couldn't avoid getting pre-diabetes with maintaining a healthy weight and exercise, I had gestational diabetes with, with my pregnancy. all of them? Not with Ben. Okay. And- That was, isn't he the last- Yeah, which is a blessing. That was nice. It Thank was you, because if you're in the hospital and have steroids, it makes everything much worse yeah. if you have diabetes. But you had it with the other two pregnancies? Yes. And I've like failed Thank my you, postpartum Lord. glucose test and all that. I mean, I've done, I, it's like it's in my genes somewhere. Okay. So I've been doing all those things like exercising, trying to avoid getting it as I get older, but I've been feeling so sick and my doctor did all these tests, tried to figure things out. They thought I was in menopause for a while, things like that. It's we're pretty certain it's, it's pre-diabetes. I failed all the tests, so because the things you that typically avoid you getting diabetes didn't work for me. Sugar is like a would just completely. And if I get type two diabetes, I mean it's serious. Like I don't want to be on medication. It can affect my organs. So when um, you think say so you don't eat sugar, it's like you don't eat cookies, or is sugar in so many things that you have to avoid? Yeah, it's in a lot of things, and I can't have white carbs. Okay, so like white potatoes, white bread. Because it messes with your insulin. Yeah, yeah. flour tortillas. Oh, do you? What do you miss the most? Uh, well, I'm about a month into it. Um, so oh, I this feel, is a new thing. Yeah, I feel so okay. good right now that good. I don't feel I don't miss a whole lot of things because of how you feel. Yes, because yeah. I felt 
terrible. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just felt terrible. So can you have like almond flour and... Yeah, so I, so I have to have carbs. I just have to have good carbs. So I can have... I figured out that I, I can do like... They make something called Swerve. It's like a sugar that's okay. um, for diabetics okay. that has... It's like a, it has like natural stuff in okay. it. Okay. I haven't used it yet. My friend told me about it. And then I wheat flour. So I can use wheat flour and everything. Oh, okay. And I've found like some like chocolate chips that have swerve in it Look that are, yeah. so I'm trying, I'm going to figure try. it out. Yeah. So I can you have. You should try out my friend Siete. That's not his name. That's what it sounded like. Like you should try what? my friend Siete. <laughs> Our friends own a company called Siete. Oh. But they make, um, it would be, that may not necessarily be best for you, but it's all grain free. So I know that you can said you could have wheat flour. I can, yeah. But it's all grain free. So it's okay. like cassava flour and almond flour. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, but they're really, really g- a good substitute if you're having to miss out on things. Yeah, I'll look into it. But you can have wheat. So you can get wheat tortillas. Can't you? Okay, yeah, they don't taste as good as They don't taste as good. Uh, CIT, I think, tastes really good. Okay, so you're loving the creamer. I am, and I have, because I have four boys who like to play outside. I like this Grandma's Secret Spot Remover. You can buy it in bulk on Amazon. Oh, you're talking for their clothes. Yes, because, so when they were younger, I didn't have as, I mean, when they had like spit up and stuff. But lately, in the last year, I mean, they play outside all uh-huh. the time. Yeah. And now they're, they play to play football outside. So they get grass. Grass. Yeah. Like they come home from school with grass stains. And so we, I mean, I I just have, I have mud and grass on my, on their clothes all the time. So it works. Grandma's secret. Yeah, secret spot remover. Spot remover. I got an ink stain out of my jeans because my two-year-old wrote on my pants. That's good to know. I yeah. have, these are not my favorite pair of jeans. I have a favorite pair of jeans that I wear all the time. They're from Madewell. They're just my favorite. Oh, I need to get a pair of those. Oh, Madewell's the best. But they have the spot on them and I don't know what it is. Like it's, I have no idea what it is. I've never gotten it off. I still wear them because I could care less. Yeah. But I should try grandma's secret spot remover. Okay. If you have kids who make messes, it's good to it's go. Good. Okay, yeah. what's the third thing you're loving? I like Santa McCracken's Christmas album. Oh, uh, yeah. Her song, This Is The Christ, which is on another album of hers, Uh huh. is my favorite. Uh, we were just, um, we're recording this before Christmas, FYI. We were just listening to in the office, Andrew Peterson's Behold oh, the Lamb. So good. It's so good. One. Have you seen that in person? No, I haven't. Highly recommend. It's so good. I know. Yeah. He comes to Arkansas periodically. What are you reading? Well, I'm in seminary, so I'm reading a book, some books on missiology right now. Okay. Missions. Uh huh. Um, and which has really made me excited and more passionate about Bible literacy. Cause how else are we going to, because the the book one of the books was talking about the importance of uh, the the most faithful missionaries are the ones who who basically know their Bibles mm. and so I have often not thought about the connection there is that if we care about Bible literacy here in America we should care about it everywhere, everywhere. and so it's just something I care about so yeah. and then I'm doing some speaking in the spring that I'm reading on the storyline of scripture because I'm teaching on the storyline of scripture. You're teaching on what? The story of scripture. Okay. Uh, in a couple of different venues. So I'm Love reading it. about that. Love it. Well, Courtney, thank you so much. Thanks thank for you your for story. Having me. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for writing. Thank you for teaching. Thank you for all the things we're doing for the church and for women. And well, can't wait till you graduate seminary. Oh, my whole family would be excited when I graduate so seminary. Happy, so It'll happy. It'll be fun to have all my boys there. I know. Won't that be great? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on the happy hour. Oh, thank you. You guys, I am so thankful for how God intervened in Courtney and her son's life in the midst of such a traumatic birth and during her postpartum. When Courtney shared that emotions are good, but they are not the leader of our truth. I was like, yes, and yes, and yes. Amen, 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 Courtney. I love that. And I want you women to believe that as well, to look for the word and listen to the Holy Spirit, even in the midst of our feelings. Our feelings are real and they're good, but they are not in charge. Thank you, Courtney, for sharing your story with us. Thank you for being honest about the fears and the uncertainty. I'm so thankful for her new book and how it will help each of us to feel our emotions, but not be led by them. Today's show was edited by Chris with Podshaper and the music was developed for the show by Matt Graham. Show notes are written by Aki Slockers and the whole thing is organized by Lindsay Sweeney. Next week, Tara Lynn St. Ellen joins me for the happy hour. My assistant Lindsay met her last year while we were at the She Speaks conference. She heard her share her story a bit and knew that this 20-something beauty queen from Jersey had such a good story to share with us. And she was right. Tara Lynn is 25. She's Haitian American, former Miss Black New Jersey, and she speaks boldly about being adorned for battle as daughters of the Most High King. You're gonna love her style of faith and fashion and passion for women to walk in our true identity of God's daughter. And it was so fun for me to sit down with this 20-something girl and also just cheer her on because 
because I love what these 20-something women are doing. Guys, enjoy your week. Share the show with a girlfriend. Have a happy hour with a friend. I'll see you on Friday for your last decade, and I'll see you next week with my new friend, Tara Lynn. 